Hello everyone, myself Dr. Abhishek Kumar. Welcome to lecture 5 of the course Applied Seismology for Engineers. In today's lecture, we will be covering an important topic that is seismic gaps. So far based on our understanding and the lectures which we have discussed prior to this particular lecture, we have an understanding about that there are different layers exist at different different depths within earth and depending upon the physical properties as well as the temperature variation at different depths, there are generation of convection currents. Primarily because of the convection currents which are generating in the mantle that will result in movement or development of thrust at the base of the crystal medium as a result of which the medium of the crust will start moving in different direction. This can be also witnessed on the surface in the form of continental crust as well as oceanic crust. If we will bring the GPS based measurements into account, we can see that across the globe there are different plates which exist and such plates are moving in different directions at different rates. So, depending upon the zone where the two plates are coming in contact with each other, there can be possibility that the two plates are converging towards each other or the two plates are diverging away from each other or there is slight pass movement between the plates. Depending upon the stresses which are going to develop or going to mobilize at the interface between the two plates which are in contact with each other, there will be development of strain energy which is getting accumulated at the fault interface. Once the strain energy accumulation exceeds the in situ capacity of the medium, the medium will undergo rupture, the, there can be generation of heat, there can be generation, there can be melting of the material, there can be rupture taking place. Subsequently, there will be generation of seismic waves from the source and when these waves will start moving away from the focus or from the epicenter and reaching to different locations, you may experience if you are located maybe 50 kilometer, 100 kilometer, 150 kilometer away from your epicenter with some delay of the order of few seconds, you may see some kind of shaking experience at your site of interest. This shaking is basically the response of your system whether it is a building, it is a ground, how the system is going to respond to the seismic waves which have been generated from the source modified by the propagation medium and then reaching subsequently to your site of interest. Now, whenever we are interested to find out the seismic loading conditions because when we discuss about seismic waves, the primary objective here as far as this particular course is concerned is to identify what is the potential loading in a particular region which is going to be experienced by a particular structure. It can be at bedrock medium, it can be at surface medium or subsequently you can, you can generate ground motion or response spectra for a particular building as far as earthquake resistant design is concerned. So, whenever we target to carry out such studies, we will be interested to find out what are the potential locations which are actually capable of producing earthquakes. Generally, we take into account the faults which are located within 200, 300, 400 kilometer radial distance from your site of interest because even if there is some seismic source located at 400 kilometer radial distance and if this particular source is capable of producing earthquake of maybe major major to great earthquakes, certainly a great earthquake happened at 400 kilometer can also cause significant ground shaking, taking the propagation path effect and local site effect into account. Once this modified ground motion reaches to your site of interest, the building may experience severe shaking, the soil may undergo loss of strength or there can be significant amplification in the ground shaking between bedrock and the surface. As a result, the earthquake loading which is going to be transferred from a distant earthquake also can cause severe 
ground shaking and subsequently if the building is not designed properly it can lead to partial damage to complete collapse of the building. So, in order to account in order to find out what are the potential loadings which are going to come because of earthquakes happening in the surrounding regions one has to find out what are the potential seismic sources. In addition to that we will also find out what are the potential earthquake magnitudes which have happened in the past. Usually past earthquake information one can collect from different sources maybe from Indian meteorological department, United States geological survey, northern California earthquake data center and many more such repositories are there based on which depending upon your site location and the radial distance within which you are interested to find out information about past earthquakes you can go through these sites and you can collect more and more information. So, once you have information about faults information about the source as well as events you can prepare map seismotectonic map that will help you in understanding what are the seismic sources which have produced maybe magnitude 4, magnitude 5, 6, 7, 8, 8.5 in the epicentral region of 400 kilometer, 300 kilometer with respect to your site as center and then we can determine in seismic hazard analysis uh, we will discuss how one can determine the expected level of ground shaking because of potential earthquakes. One is potential earthquake and second one is the worst scenario earthquake. So, that we will discuss in coming slides. Now, whenever we are uh, interested to find out what are the potential sources which can produce earthquake usually that particular information is significantly dependent on what information about historic earthquakes or the earthquakes uh, which, which are known to us before actually recording of ground shaking started recording of ground motion has started. So, any earthquake which has happened before uh, the recording of uh, ground vibration has started you can refer that to historic earthquake because there is actually no record available, but there are evidences suggesting some damages have happened to that particular earthquake and how much damage have happened that one can refer to uh, different intensity scales and the kind of damage which has been experienced by people living in the epicentral region and at distant location as well. Sometimes there are trained people who can also help in determining the intensity of ground shaking during a particular earthquake. So, using the intensity values one can determine the iso seismal maps and again using the iso seismal maps if later on you are having iso seismal map also as well as ground shaking also one can establish correlation between the two and then try finding out how much probably the level of ground shaking in terms of peak ground acceleration in terms of spectral acceleration might have generated during a particular earthquake which happened might be 50 years, 100 years before present. So, that will give you an understanding about even though there was no information about ground motion records, but using the information available from ISO seismal map or intensity map you can have significant understanding about earthquake and its damage characteristics. Now, when we are referring to faults, when we are referring to uh, our understanding about the seismic activity in a region, solely it will be governed by two factors. One is the seismic sources which are available in a particular region. Secondly, what is the information about past earthquakes known to us? We often uh, uh, come across the information that such and such earthquake has happened at some place which triggered lot of damages. Even though the site was very vulnerable to earthquake induced damages, but still during a particular earthquake the amount of damages has happened are significantly larger. That means, though you are having some understanding about faults, some understanding about past earthquakes may be 100 years, 150 years, still there is some information which is lacking with us which will help in understanding the correct seismic activity of a particular region. That means, uh, once the complete information about past earthquake is known to us then we can say 
how many four magnitude, five magnitude, six magnitude and subsequently different magnitude earthquakes can happen maybe per year across your entire seismotectonic province. But certainly the confidence of this particular estimation also depends on how much data about past earthquake is known to us. If we discuss about the correlation between the frequency of earthquake occurrence and the magnitude of earthquake, we will understand that as you go for larger and larger magnitude earthquake, the frequency of those earthquakes to occur in the same location will significantly reduce. It can also be understood from the analogy that with larger magnitude for an earthquake of larger magnitude to happen, there it requires large amount of strain energy to get accumulated and subsequent to release of seismic energy. So, in order to accumulate the seismic energy which can produce a 3 magnitude earthquake, certainly you will require less time. Consider that two faults are there which are slide past each other as a result of which there will be some strain energy generating at the interface. So, in order to cause 3 magnitude earthquake, you require significantly low value of strain energy. That is how. So, if some process is going on such that every 6 month, every 7 months, the strain energy which is getting accumulated is capable of producing 4 magnitude earthquakes and the conditions in presence of barriers and, and uh, the other uh, complexity is not there, then you can experience 4 magnitude earthquakes very frequently. On the contrary, if you are talking about maybe 7 magnitude earthquake, 8 magnitude earthquakes, the amount of strain energy required, the amount of seismic energy which will be released during those earthquakes will be many fold higher in comparison to a 3 magnitude earthquakes. So, consider that situation that an 8 magnitude earthquake is going to happen and on a fault which is actually having slide past nature. Now, this particular fault block will require maybe 500 years, 600 years, maybe 1000 years, 5000 years such that a continuous accumulation of strain energy along this particular fault segment should be sufficient enough to cause to trigger seismic energy equivalent to 8 magnitude earthquake. If this the other way of seeing this particular problem is if we have complete information for last 100 years, we can be more confident about lower magnitude earthquake, but as you increase the magnitude of the earthquake, more uncertainty in terms of its repetition primarily on primarily during the design life of the structure is coming into picture. So, that means, if we are having some data let us say for last 100 years, 200 years, we will be more confident about 4 magnitude earthquake, 5 magnitude earthquake return period in comparison to maybe 8 magnitude earthquake, because hardly you will see maximum 1 or 2, magn two earthquakes of maybe 8 magnitude and that two are happening at two different locations not at same fault. So, based on one earthquake alone, it is very difficult to find out how frequently this earthquake is going to get repeated. This is one scenario. Second scenario is, if this particular 8 magnitude earthquake, which considering the rate at which strain energy is getting accumulated at the fault block, the situation is like, it can happen only once in 700 years, 800 years. And this 800 years, time is falling outside the 150 years, 120 years of the duration from which the earthquake catalog is available to the user. That means, at present I am having data of last 150 years, but an 8 magnitude earthquake in my region of interest has happened maybe 170 years back. So, certainly that particular earthquake magnitude will not be part of my present catalog. And if I even monitor, uh, if I try to forecast for last maybe uh, next 400 years, 500 years, then there are chances because this earthquake of 8 magnitude can repeat at every 500 years. So, though it has happened last maybe 160 years, 170 years and it was not the part of your earthquake catalog, but there are more chances that 300, 350 years 
again in the future this earthquake can cause repeated damage. Now, this was a critical example where the duration of earthquake catalog and the, the duration when 8 magnitude earthquake has happened was very close. That means, 8 magnitude earthquake has happened at 150 years from present, however, the earthquake catalog is there for till 120 years. So, there is only a gap of 30 years. Another possibility which may arise is you are having an earthquake catalog of 120 years and 8 magnitude earthquake has happened just 480 years from present. So, this is this is like though we do not have supporting information at present, but because these are historic earthquakes. So, in order to understand historic earthquake one, to, one has to have a detailed information about paleo seismic investigations, historic earthquake to understanding about seismic activity of each of the fault, rupture characteristics and many more information which may give you a complete picture, but it is not available at present. So, if that is the scenario where 4 uh, 1 8 magnitude earthquake has happened maybe 480 years from present, that means considering that 8 magnitude earthquake can happen once in every 500 years, your site though as a designer, though as a uh, uh, the person who is dealing with uh, estimation of earthquake uh, magnitude, the information with that the site can also experience 8 magnitude earthquake is not there. So, certainly that may or may not be taken into account, but that does not deny the fact that 8 magnitude earthquake had actually occurred at a particular site and keeping that the return period of that particular earthquake is 500 years, your site may experience another 8 magnitude earthquake in next 20 years. So, it was there was no mention of 8 magnitude earthquake in your last 100 years, 120 years, 150 years earthquake catalog because it has not happened or you do not have so far collected information in the literature or based on your field investigation suggesting 8 magnitude earthquake has actually occurred to the site, but later on someone, someone does uh, information uh, analysis related to historic earthquake and find out ok 400 years, 480 years from present there was an earthquake of 8 magnitude. Now, you have constructed your building which is having a tentative life of 35, 40 years taking into account that 8 magnitude earthquake is not going to happen to the building and then suddenly in the future 20 years from now there is an 8 magnitude earthquake which happens in your seismotectonic region which will trigger significant ground shaking. Since your building is not designed for that particular earthquake loading, it may experience minor shaking, it may experience major cracks, complete collapse depending upon what is the loading you have designed building for and what is the loading which are going to generate because of 8 magnitude or 8.5 magnitude earthquake. So, that means, as far as information about the return period of earthquake is concerned, you can always gain more and more confidence in terms of return period only when you have more and more information about historic earthquakes. At the same time keeping in mind that higher is the magnitude of the earthquake, more time it will take there will be longer return period for that earthquake to occur to get repeated during the design life. So, there will be a chance that 7 magnitude 8 magnitude earthquake at present your earthquake catalog is not showing, but might have happened in the past. So, taking that possibility also into account we have to see what best we can do in order to find out earthquake loading condition. So, today's topic seismic gap basically suggest that keeping the rupture characteristics, keeping the current tectonics at different segments of the fault, there can be possibility one, once we discuss about the possibility that considering longer return period for larger magnitude earthquake that such an event is not present in your earthquake catalog. Seismic gap suggest that in terms of space, in terms of time, there might be some locations which have not triggered earthquake in last maybe 200 years, 300 years, 400 years or some sections are there which are showing almost very low seismicity in comparison to surrounding regions. So, there might be something additional going on in those particular locations. Certainly, one cannot consider that those locations or segments of a particular fault 
where other segments are quite active and this particular segment is inactive will not produce earthquake. That is why it is called as seismic gaps. So, basically there are events, there are faults on which such events are happening. Suddenly you will realize that there are events happening on one side of the segment and other side of the segment repeatedly and there are some segments which are actually lying dormant, no sign of seismic activity at least in last 100 years, 200 years because you do not have complete information prior to those 200 years. So, such seismic gaps why the question comes was why such seismic gaps are important. Now, these are important because these are segments of faults which at present may not show some seismic activity, but other segments on the same fault exist which are also showing seismic activity in terms of maybe moderate earthquake in terms of larger earthquakes. So, we have to one has to take into account that it is not actually an inactive portion of the fault, it is rather a gap. Gap means some gap is there pending which is actually prolonged, which is actually pending for any kind of major to great earthquakes in the near future. So, one the first discussion was like we do not have complete information in terms of uh, historic earthquakes because the return period is significantly larger than the size of the earthquake catalog one has. Second one is during last 500 years there has not been an earthquake in last 500, 1000 years also there has not been an earthquake because considering the seismic activity of the fault. 7 magnitude earthquake, 8 magnitude earthquake may happen once in 1500 years, 2000 years. Now, certainly either you will, I mean you cannot wait for 2000 years to correctly understand the seismic activity or you will not have the complete information of what has happened for on, on each and every fault in terms of a repetition of different, different earthquakes. So, in such a case there will be some seismic gaps because of course, ground deformation is happening fault movements are also continuous process. So, there is some of the other activity happening at those particular segments which are identified as gaps. Importantly, these are identified as gaps. So, that means, these are the location where potentially major to great earthquakes are due, yet there is no complete information when this earthquake is going to come, but considering the size of earthquake which is like 7, 8 and the kind of damage which if earthquake in this particular gap happens during the design life, what sort of damage scenario it can create, what kind of devast devastation it can create. So, we cannot completely ignore the segment which has not shown any sign of seismic activity in last 300 years, 400 years considering the uh, earthquake rate log. So, that those segments which are uh, actually showing complete inactivity for last 500 years but in addition to those based on current GPS measurement, uh, triangulation survey, there are some indication that some of the other seismic activity strain energy build up in terms of thermal images also that which, which directly indirectly suggest that there are some seismic activities or strain energy which is getting built up in those uh, uh, locations. So, one cannot deny the fact that these locations will certainly show some sign of activity in the near future. Thirdly, once we go for uh, hazard analysis, particularly when we are uh, thinking about hazard with respect to the probability of its occurrence, we will see that larger is the magnitude of the earthquake, though it can cause significant ground shaking, but the chance of that earthquake to get repeated during the design life of the structure will be relatively less. So, the probability of larger magnitude is less, but at the same time if these earthquakes are going to come these may cause devastation. So, one has to we have a relative judgment about whenever we are talking about seismic gap whether to take the seismic gap and what is the worst scenario corresponding to those seismic gap, whether it is uh, uh, justified to take those worst scenario and perform seismic hazard analysis or you can completely ignore those seismic gaps and go ahead with the seismic hazard analysis. So, this is uh, one thing where one, one has to uh, take suitable decision. So, seismic gap as I suggested here 
we will be discussing in today's lecture that is lecture 5. So, this we have already discussed that earth crust is divided into multiple layers or plates which are moving with respect to each other. Primarily when we discuss about uh, uh, earthquake occurrence, we will be more focusing on convection currents which are actually generated in the mental region. As I mentioned earlier, as you go in deeper regions, though there are convection currents, their contribution related to movement of the plate is significantly low. So, so we can avoid such uh, uh, contributions to the occurrence of the earthquake. So, building up of strain energy, it is a continuous process. Somewhere it will happen slowly, somewhere it may happen very uh, fast depending upon the tectonics and uh, depending upon the rate at which the two plates are moving as well as in addition because it is it is not only that just two plates are coming in contact with each other, there might be some of the other activity happening in the peripheral region or there might be other plate boundaries existing with different rate of convergence or divergence in the epicentral region. So, we have to take those also into account and then see what is the uh, rate at which building up of strain energy is happening and subsequently up till elastic strain accumulation everything is okay. When the strain energy accumulate, uh, accumulation exceeds the shear strength of the soil, you will have failure and that will result in the occurrence of the earthquake. Usually, these are located with respect to linear features because again if you, if you uh, explore with respect to the faults, most of the time you will see linear features which have been identified in the literature in a per, for a particular region. In addition, because identification of the fault is also a continuous process and it usually takes longer time. So, many a times you will see that there are some epicenters, but there are no faults identified so far in a particular region. So, how to deal with those? We will discuss in uh, subsequent lectures which are like bit advanced topics. So, when strain accumulation exceeds the in situ shear strength, there will be release of energy in terms of earthquakes and uh, as the name suggests earthquakes. So, that means there will be some quake happening in the earth as a result disturbance in terms of seismic wave will propagate start from the epicenter and will propagate in all the directions. Okay. So, as I mentioned the strain accumulation is a continuous process, but whether the accumulation of strain and subsequent release of strain these two processes are happening simultaneously or are happening continuously in a particular region will decide how frequently earthquakes are experienced at a particular site. So, there might be some locations where the accumulation of strain energy is happening at a relatively low spe speed. So, that you may say at one location the rate of strain energy or the, the rate of convergence might be happening at 5 centimeter per year and other locations are there it is happening maybe 1 centimeter per year. So, certainly those locations where the strain energy is uh, the strain is accumulating at a uh, lower pace that means those may show some sign of seismic activity in longer run not in uh, maybe 100 years 200 years like that. So, keeping the strain accumulation as a continuous process at time there might be rupture frequently witnessed at a particular site. In addition there might be segments which are not showing rupture despite the fact that strain energy accumulation can be witnessed, can be verified with respect to GPS measurement, with respect to in situ measurements. So, such location which are indication of locations without rupture for a prolonged duration are called as seismic gaps. As mentioned earlier, there can be seismic gap both in terms of space that means, if you consider a particular fault length some segments of the fault length are showing very frequent seismic activity that means, strain accumulation, release of strain, strain accumulation, release of strain. However, at the same time certain segment in the same fault are existing which though are showing some sign of strain accumulation, but there are no earthquakes happening over there. So, those are called as temporal in terms of there was some earthquake maybe 700 years back, 500 years back but no sign of seismic activity in last 500 years. So, you call it as temporal seismic gap. In addition as I mentioned some segments are there which are not showing the sign of 
seismic activity, but others are showing the sign of seismic activity. So, those are called as spatial locations potentially uh, potential seismic gaps. So, when we say about seismic gap, it is both in terms of space as well as time. So, location which are not showing any sign of earthquake occurrence for last 500 years, 600 years, maybe longer than that, certainly these are prominent location because in situ measurements shows some strain energy accumulation continuously happening in those location. Once the strain energy accumulation is happening, certainly the strain energy building up will also happen at some segment in that particular uh, uh, fault block which may trigger earthquake may be next 15 years, 10 years, 30 years, 40 years depending upon the rate at which strain accumulation is happening and what is the uh, ground deformation which is uh, resulting in the deformation uh, in the release of some portion of strain energy. At the same time temporal because generally the process dominating fault mechanism all along the fault length more or less remains uniform. So, you may see some segments which are showing continuous sign of earthquake occurrence and then some segments which are completely inactive. So, you may say those are like spatial distribution of seismic activity and regions which are potentially identified as seismic gaps. Not every time we will say some location which are uh, not producing any earthquake as seismic gap. So, one has to take into account what is the ongoing processes at present based on in situ measurement based on remote sensing based measurements also and then cross verify with respect to the ground that actually there is some process happening continuously in the region though there is no seismic activity, but all the surrounding evidences suggest that some seismic activity can be experienced in the next 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. So, that is called as seismic gaps. So, gaps available in terms of seismic activity in terms of occurrence of earthquake events that is called as the term is called as seismic gap. The absence of larger earthquake in one region generally along a tectonic front or a fault. So, absence so surrounding regions on the same fault is showing maybe 7 magnitude earthquake, 6 magnitude earthquake at least once in 50 years, 100 years, but then there are segments which are completely inactive or there is no absence. If you, if you take earthquake catalog into account and superimpose that on source information, you came across that there are segments which are not showing the sign of seismic activity at all. So, those will be identified as seismic gap. So, these are the segments with gaps in spatial distribution of rupture zones. Usually when there is an earthquake that means the material has undergone failure. Now, depending upon how much strain energy was involved that will define how much of the area which has undergone rupture of the order of maybe few hundreds of kilometer in length and, and uh, maybe few tens of kilometer in uh, width that is generally the area which may undergo rupture maybe uh, where 7, 7.5 magnitude earthquake is, is uh, has happened. So, one, one can explore uh, in the literature like some papers which are suggesting what is the tentative area which has undergone rupture primarily during different different earthquakes. One can refer to papers where 1934 there was an earthquake in Bihar, Nepal which had undergone rupture. So, calculation then 1833 again there was some area which has undergone rupture. So, how much was that some area? You can see the, the, the area which is actually undergone rupture along the fault length it is extending maybe of hundreds of kilometers to maybe 60 to 70 of kilometers or maybe this is this is a, a rough idea about what is the range of area which undergoes rupture which undergoes failure when earthquake events which have had happened in the past uh, uh, triggered. So, these there are the segments which are uh, showing some sign of gaps in terms of spatial distribution of rupture. Rupture means the area which has undergone failure in terms of heat, in terms of melting, in terms of breakage. So, these are potentially the zones of largest earthquakes in a seismic belt. Such gaps are tectonically time bombs. Time bombs means energy accumulation is going on and then it may trigger someday. We, we, we still uh, uh, do not have complete information to say whether it is going to trigger in last next, next 5 years, next 10 years or so, but certainly 
because there are accumulation of strain energy and adjoining sections of the same fault are showing sign of rupture, sign of frequent earthquakes. So, certainly this particular gap will also show some seismic activity right now it is acting as a, a bomb which is which is ready to get triggered. So, waiting to go off in the form of major to even great earthquakes usually whenever we say about seismic gap we will be interested to find out location which are due for major to great earthquakes because usually minor earthquakes it is happening so frequently that uh, primarily if you if you compare the kind of damages which are likely to happen during major to great earthquakes will be significantly larger in comparison to small earthquakes. So, generally we refer to seismic gap to those locations which are due to uh, occurrence of major to great earthquakes. So, especially we can say seismic gaps are the sections of unruptured faults. As I mentioned, there will be some faults, some segments of the fault which are showing uh, for, uh, rupture or uh, earthquakes that means they have undergone rupture, but there might be some segment which remain unruptured during a prolonged duration. So, that will be called a spatial distribution or spatially identified zones of seismic gaps. So, these segments have high tendency to produce larger magnitude earthquakes in the near rupture, in the, in the next rupture. Whenever the earth, uh, rupture is going to happen, certainly that will cause maybe major to great earthquakes and whenever these, devast uh, these earthquakes are going to come, these may cause lot of devastations. And then temporal, as I mentioned, there might be some location which have not shown any sign of seismic activity which have not ruptured for a considerable amount of time. Whenever I say considerable amount of time means based on the information which is known to us. Again, when I say known to us, that means based on the past earthquake information collected from different uh, literature, we have developed our earthquake catalog. So, one is whether the earthquake has not happened at all or second is we do not have complete information about that particular earthquake. So, that will also decide whether a uh, particular location should be called as seismic gap or it should not be called as seismic gap rather there is a need to study in detail about what has happened in the last 500 years, whether there was some event which at present we are considering has not happened resulting in declaration of that particular location as seismic gap or there was no earthquake at all. So, such investigations will help us in arriving at decisions whether location which are showing unruptured faults are actually the potential location of seismic gaps which can experience major to great earthquakes in the future. In other words, the inter seismic, inter -seismic locking period of such segments on a fault are relatively longer. As I mentioned maybe 100 years, 200 years at least it should have shown some signature of seismic activity, but it has not shown. So, that means some kind of locking period is there. After that, once it reaches to that locking period such so that no accumulation of strain energy is further possible, we can go with respect to, uh, we may experience some kind of uh, seismic gap. Now, here we can see, so this is one continuous segment of the fault line, which is running all along maybe 500, 600 kilometer or maybe more than that. Again, you see not entire length of the fault will undergo rupture during a particular earthquake. Why? Because considering the length of the fault might be 600 kilometers, suppose it is running. Now, it will be almost impossible that strain accumulation all along 600 kilometer happen at the same rate triggering earthquake at the same time, because there is there are uh, uh, heterogeneity which are present in the medium, there is undulations which are present in the medium even the rate at which strain accumulation is happening will not be uniform all along the 600 kilometer uh, length of the fault. So, in such a case what happens depending upon what is the strain accumulation happening here, 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 different segments of the faults which may be 100 kilometer, 80 kilometer depending upon what is the governing tectonics, what is the fault plane solution dominating in different different sections. So, one can identify what are the section which are behaving independently. 
so these are basically one was fault line and then within the fault line depending upon uh, the seismic activity depending upon dominating fault mechanism one can again bifurcate or segregate different segments which are called as fault segments so there are some location which have shown uh, rupture so basically these are the location which have shown rupture so rupture when we when i say if if you are looking at this uh, fault line in plan you will see some linear feature fault rupture will be happening perpendicular to this linear feature means you are going below the ground surface and there is some length and some width which is actually undergoing rupture so you can see over here there was some length and width which was below the ground surface and this entire area has undergone rupture when it has undergone rupture that means some energy which was otherwise getting accumulated before the uh, the, the rupture has actually triggered has been released in terms of seismic waves and then maybe some portion of energy will remain there and then further it will uh, trigger in next earthquake now at the same time you will see some segments which are showing here also there is one segment which is showing some sign of seismic activity and uh, rupture however at the same time there are some location which are not showing some kind of uh, rupture at all at the same time there are some barriers so you see in this particular earthquake this area has undergone rupture and this is the barrier within which the rupture location is constrained in this particular case also the rupture location is constrained within this particular uh, dimension so these are the barrier which are actually arresting further propagation of rupture at the same time you see there are locations which have not shown any kind of rupture as far as the known information about uh, uh historic earthquakes or recorded earthquake is concerned or based on uh, the limited information from earthquake catalog which has been developed so far so we can one can identify these are the potential location which are seismic gap as i mentioned not just because some locations are there which are not showing any kind of uh, uh, rupture one can identify or nomenclature them as seismic gap rather we have to have some supporting evidences which are suggesting that some kind of building up of strain energy is also happening over here building up of strain energy at certain rate based on in situ measurement based on satellite measurement suggesting something is happening it's not completely inactive so inactive is different not rupturing not showing sign of rupture is altogether different maybe the accumulation is happening at such a pace that it may take maybe another 600 years that the accumulated strain energy reaches to a level where it can actually trigger a major to great earthquake so identification of seismic gaps seismic gaps are generally identified to exist between the sources of two recent earthquakes prominent seismic gaps some of the prominent seismic gap are central seismic gap or cig which exist in uh, the himalayas primarily located seis central seismic gap is the location between 1934 there was an earthquake in bihar nepal so the rupture location of bihar nepal earthquake and 1905 there was an earthquake in himachal pradesh that is kangra earthquake so rupture location of 1905 and rupture location of 1934 between these two rupture location there has not been any signature of major to great earthquakes suggesting this is a potential location which is due for a major to great earthquake in near future second one you can see shumagen seismic gap in alaska elution where you can actually see there is a seismic gap between the rupture location of 1938 earthquake and 1948 earthquake along the cascadian subduction zone so you can see another seismic gap it's not located only in the himalayas but across the globe there are different different location which some segments are showing seismic activity but some segments which are not showing any sign of seismic activity at least in terms of earthquake occurrence then the gurero seismic gap which is identified at the zone located between the rupture zones of 1957 earthquake as well as 1979 earthquake so there was uh, earthquake in 1957 and 1979 and the location which is located between the rupture zone of 1957 earthquake and 1979 earthquake that has actually shown that has been identified as guerrero seismic gap 
So, once uh, 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 the designer or uh, the, the agency which is involved in seismic hazard assessment should also take these into account because these are the potential locations which can produce a significant ground shaking though are completely inactive in last several hundred years. So, according to Mugi in 1979, there are two ways one uh, two kinds of seismic gaps exist. So, one is the gaps in spatial distribution of focal region. So, if you see in terms of earthquake occurrence, there are the regions where there are earthquakes, but certain regions where there is no earthquake. Similarly, in terms of lesser magnitude earthquake, there is significant reduction in terms of seismic activity even you look into small magnitude earthquakes. So, those can also be identified as the regions where uh, uh, which require actually further detailed investigation before you can call it as a seismic gap. So, seismic gap of first kind where you can see actually uh, uh, the information or the spatial distribution of rupture location is completely absent in certain locations. So, gradual accumulation of strain energy produced large earthquakes in the same region within considerable time period. However, this large energy many a time they will not be firstly there will not be an overlap of rupture location, but at the same time you will see narrow seismic zones which are existing because there is no possibility that two rupture zones of two different earthquake can overlap with respect to each other. So, certainly there will be narrow seismic zones which are not the part of rupture zone on one side or the other side indication of seismic gaps. In case of gaps in spatial distribution of rupture location along a particular uh, belt, there are postulates that a major to great earthquake is due which someday will happen and will fill this particular gap. So, that whatever strain energy is getting built up in last 100 years, 150 years that portion significant portion of that energy will be released. Generally, it is released in terms of major to great earthquakes. Sometimes small small earthquake can delay the occurrence of this major to great earthquake. So, identify to identify such location one can explore the historical seismicity, even geodetic measurement as well as tectonic data supporting whether there is some accumulation of strain energy, some activities happening in and around of those identified seismic gap. The above space regularity was first, first pointed out by Padnov in 1965 and later it was also confirmed by Skies in 1971 for Alaska Aleutian seismic gap. So, if you look into this particular part, the Alaska Peninsula Aleutian uh, uh, seismic belt which is located to the northern part and eastern boundary of the Pacific Ring of Fire which is a very prominent location for most of the earthquakes happening across the globe. You will see there is primarily the fault mechanism is right later strikes defaulting. Also the direction of convergence becomes more oblique towards the arc and in the central and western Aleutian. So, if you look at here, they are basically the Alaska Aleutian seismic gap. So, you will see over here before uh, actually this particular location, you see this particular the entire fault length is there where you are having earthquake in different different years. Certainly, in this particular location there was no earthquake other than 1946 and 1948. So, prior to that the locations gap 2 was identified as locations of potential uh, seismic gap. In addition, you see this is the rupture location for 1938 earthquake, this is the rupture location for 1957 earthquake. As I mentioned pr in prior slide that overlapping of rupture zone will not be possible. So, there are some location which have not shown any kind of which had not shown any kind of uh, rupture or potentially the region for seismic gap. Gap 1 again you can see over here which is basically the uh, uh, later on there was some earthquake, the location is not shown over here because the rupture uh, zone was not well defined. Similarly, over here you can see 1958-1964 there was an earthquake, but till 1979 for longer period there was no earthquake there. As a result this particular segment was also identified as gap 3 for Alaska Aleutian seismic zone. So, three potentially identified seismic gap along this particular belt were the seismic gap which is located along the western part where actually 
an earthquake in 1849 had occurred. Though as I mentioned though the rupture location and uh, magnitude was not uh, clearly identified. Second one is Shumagen seismic gap which is located between 1957 and 1964 earthquake and later uh, in the year 1948 there was an earthquake, 1938 there was an earthquake which actually uh, ruptured almost half of the segment which was located between the rupture location of 1957 and 1964. So, again uh, considering the current scenario one can explore what is the uh, whether there are more chances of any rupture or, or further it can be explored. Similarly, towards the eastern part 1958 and 1964 rupture zones were there and in between the two till the year 1979 when some uh, rupture had happened, this particular rupture the zone between rupture location of 1958 and 1964 was identified as potential eastern seismic gap at Alaska Aleutian uh, seismic belt. Now, second kind of uh, uh, seismic uh, gap as I mentioned at time there will be uh, absence in terms of rupture location. Secondly, there can be gap primarily in terms of general seismic activity of a smaller magnitude earthquake in adjoining region and then there are some region where there is significant reduction in terms of smaller magnitude earthquakes. So, those can also be based on the gaps in terms of smaller magnitude activity one can identify location which are potential seismic gaps. So, these seismic gaps are distinguished by means of different reduced level of seismic activity primarily for lower magnitude earthquake or smaller magnitude earthquake. So, this is another uh, way one can identify one is like there are location which have not shown any kind of rupture. Secondly, there is significant reduction even in terms of low magnitude earthquakes happening on a particular fault segment indicating that that, that can also be potential seismic gap in the region. So, usually uh, you will see that uh, in an around of that particular region where there was a major earthquake, there is significant reduction in the seismic activity clearly suggesting that primarily in the donut shape if you see as shown in the next slide you see there is surrounding region, there was some earthquake somewhere and in the surrounding region there is significant reduction in the seismic activity primarily for smaller magnitude earthquake suggesting that this particular region is also a potential seismic gap primarily identified based on reduction in the seismicity of smaller magnitude earthquakes. Then there are uh, uh, seismic gap that is the Himalayan seismic gap. So, you can see over here uh, in, in uh, 1987 based on the seismicity pattern Khatri uh, 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 1987 paper published identified three potential seismic gap. So, from west we have the Kashmir seismic gap which was almost 250 kilometer long uh, segment located between 1905 Kangra earthquake and 2005 Kashmir earthquake which was due for any earthquake occurrence since 1555. So, that seismic gap was termed as uh, Kashmir seismic gap. Then central seismic gap as I mentioned the rupture location between 1905 Kangra earthquake and 1934. Uh, uh, Bihar Nepal earthquake. Though there were uh, earthquakes in 1505 and 1833, but still since then almost close to 200 to 500 years there has not been significant earthquake of major to uh, great earthquake which has happened in that particular region suggesting this region is also potential seismic gap. Last one is Assam seismic gap there. So, 1950 there was an earthquake in Assam and 1897 there was an earthquake in uh, Sikkim. So, the rupture location between Assam and Mishmi hill has not produced any significant earthquake clearly indicating that there might be a gap existing known as Assam seismic gap which is due to cause a significant earthquake in the near future. So, again these are postulates. So, there are some papers suggesting uh, in, in support of some seismic gap, there are some which are showing that actually it is not seismic gap. So, this is these are the location you can see here 1897 earthquake Shillong, this is the rupture location, 1934 this is a rupture location. So, these are the location which are actually suggesting potential seismic gap.
as I mentioned earlier, in addition to Himalayas and Alaska Aleutian seismic gap, other seismic gaps also exist. So, Guerrero seismic gap, which is basically a part of Pacific coast of Mexico in Guerrero, located between Cocos and North American in, uh, plate interface, is one of the seismically uh, active zone, subduction zone in Mexico. So, several a seismic slips event has occurred which has been uh, confirmed by GPS measurements also. So, towards the west of this, there has been distrib uh, slip distribution in 1979 and 1985 and to the east, there are slip distribution because of 1957 and 1964 earthquake. So, there is another gap which exists in Guerrero seismic gap, you can see over here. 1979, 1985, 2014, there were events. On other side, 1964, 1957, there were rupture locations, but since this rupture location, there is a gap. So, considering the first point, because of absence of rupture location between two already identified rupture location is potentially a seismic gap. So, this is called as Guerrero seismic gap located in the Mexican part. So, there are again further locations related to this particular gap. Other identified uh, uh, seismic gaps across the globe include the Chilean seismic gap identified as Nazca and South American subduction zone, the Hellenic subduction trench identified at African and Aegean plate subduction zone stretching from Greece to western Turkey almost 250 kilometer length is there which is identified as Hellenic subduction trench due for an earthquake. The Dai seismic gap located in Sichuan province of southwestern China and uh, uh, a part of Longshman thrust belt. So, uh, again another seismic gap exists over there. The last one is uh, the next one is the Cascadian seismic gap located at the Cascadian subduction zone along the western coast of North America where the Juan de Fuca subducts under the North American plate. So, again there also the Cascadian subduction zone exists, the Elegan subduction trench is also there, the Dai seismic uh, gap also exists, the Chilean seismic gap exists, the New Madrid seismic gap also exists identified as uh, the, the location almost 240 kilometer uh, length, the key channel seismic gap in Philippines is also a potential seismic gap. So, I have given here some uh, uh, information about well identified seismic gap across the globe. If one is interested, you can still go through lot of literature which is available to give further information about these locations and can, can study why these are called as uh, seismic gap and how these are relevance, relevant and important as far as uh, regional seismic hazard studies, regional uh, vulnerability studies are concerned. So, monitoring seismic gaps is important to keep a track of strain accumulation because strain accumulation is happening though earthquakes are not there, but strain accumulation will give you an identity an idea about roughly how much uh, on and every strain is getting accumulated and tentatively what are the potential location where too much of strain accumulation has happened which is uh, probably location for future earthquake occurrence. So, few method based on which in situ measurements can be done like ground, uh, uh, global positioning system will also give you an understanding about ground deformation and one can correlate with respect to strain accumulation. Then based on electrical conductivity of earth crust also one can identify the potential location, offshore ocean, uh, ocean bottom pressure gauges and GPS acoustic uh, stations. So, there are some method based on which one can go for detailed investigation and narrow down some location which are suggesting regions of strain accumulation. And in addition satellite data which will also correlate what is the rate at which ground deformation is happening in different different locations. So, one is INSAR interferometry based synthetic aperture uh, radar based on which one can identify the rate at which ground deformations are happening in terms of fringes. Then sea floor drill holes will also give you an indication about what is the rate even though the, the accumulation is happening or deformation is happening at very slow rate, what is actually that slow rate. And of course, potential field measurement will also narrow down 
to some location which are which can be uh, nomenclatured as potential seismic gap of course one has to have more detailed in situ investigation to support before claiming that particular location is seismic gap so thank you everyone uh, this is all about the seismic gap this is one pictorial view about how one can monitor the ground displacement using remote sensing data and correlate with respect to strain accumulation. So, thank you everyone.